Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, despite the weather. Really appreciate it. Um, so as, as Kirby said, um, one of the things I love doing outside of work is spending time with my horse. So shameless promotion here. This is my lovely horse. And I picked this picture oops, before the weather we had, so you can't get too angry at me. Um, <laughs> so my discussion this evening is on gastric ulcers. And I was really happy when um, Kirby and Crystal kind of presented me with this idea because in the three and a half uh, months that I've been at the clinic, I've seen a number of very interesting cases um, that kind of center around gastric ulcers. So, and the question that these cases have raised for me has been, are gastric ulcers the problem for this horse, specifically? Because oftentimes we see horses that have ulcers that have so many other things going on. So that's why I've entitled uh, my presentation, Are Gastric Ulcers the Problem? So the outline for my presentation, we're going to talk about the five W's um, that we all learned in elementary school, who, what, where, when, why, and then I'm going to walk you through a case that we saw at the clinic recently um, that I found very interesting. So who gets gastric ulcers, um, what are the symptoms, and what are gastric ulcers themselves, um, where and how do gastric ulcers form? It should seem like an easy question, but it's actually a little bit um, more complicated than you might think. Um, when do horses get gastric ulcers? So what circumstances can surround them developing ulcers? And then ultimately, why does this happen? Because that's the question we would all love to be able to answer. And then finally, we're going to uh, discuss uh, the case of Roxy and diagnostics and treatment of gastric ulcers. Okay, so starting off with the who. So just put a bunch of different photos up here. Um, the take home from this is pretty much any horse can end up with gastric ulcers. Um, this next slide, um, these are some statistics that Ella, our lovely vet from Vitoquinol, um, presented to us uh, when she came to do a talk at the clinic. And um, this is a collection of studies and uh, just looking at the statistics that they found. So as you can see, like pretty wide range of horses, lots of performance horses that have been um, surveyed to see whether or not they have ulcers. Um, and looking at these numbers, like it's kind of the majority, not exactly a rare phenomenon, um, as we might think. So, um, and, and including everything from foals to Western and English show horses. I also found a study um, that looked at gastric ulcers in wild horses, because that's kind of a question. We, we look at all of these performance horses, but how about horses in the wild? Is this truly um, something we would find in normal horses? And they did, in fact, find in a study that up 25 to 30% of feral horses that they surveyed um, also had gastric ulcers. So that's an interesting finding, but should be coupled with the knowledge that these feral horses were subjected to capture and transportation and handling by humans. So did we cause the ulcers, or were they pre-existing um, before they'd been handled? So what? What are the symptoms of gastric ulcers? Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. These are just some of the most common um, clinical signs that clients kind of bring to our attention when uh, gastric ulcers are on our list of differentials. Um, so everything from a decreased appetite and potentially recurrent colic um, to roughening of the hair coat, uh, decreased energy. And sometimes it's as, as vague as my horse just isn't right. He's not performing. He's not himself. Um, which isn't a whole lot to go on, but it's a very common complaint. So the take home again is that very variable symptoms and they can be very subtle. There we go. So the what is what are gastric ulcers? Um, so the simple, I guess, scientific definition is that they're erosions or defects in the squamous or glandular mucosa of the stomach. So you'll notice there that I use two different descriptors for the lining of the stomach, and that's very, very important uh, when we talk about equine gastric ulcers. On the bottom there in the picture, it's just, um, you can see various grades of ulcers from a normal stomach here all the way up to a severely ulcerated stomach here, which we would call grade three ulcers. So the equine stomach has two kind of different um, portions. It's one, uh, one stomach, like one compartment, but the portion um, around the esophagus is what we call squamous mucosa. You can kind of think of it similar to your skin. Not many glands, um, just kind of a, a thick protective layer, whereas the portion of the stomach um, kind of 
around where the uh, intestine connects to the stomach, more around the bottom of the stomach, we refer to as glandular mucosa. So it contains all of the glands that produce the gastric acid that helps to digest food. And the glandular mucosa also produces a lot of mucus, which is important because the acid produced by the stomach would damage the stomach if the mucus wasn't there to protect the stomach. Um, and then these two portions of the stomach are divided very nicely by a line that we call the Margo Placatus. And this is a very important anatomical structure for us when we go in and investigate a horse for ulcers. So um, I guess the other thing I will mention here as well is the ulcers that we get in the squamous portion of the stomach versus the glandular portion of the stomach are quite different. Um, squamous ulcers are far more common and they respond much more um, predictably to treatment. Whereas ulcers that are found in the glandular portion of the stomach, more around the, um, the intestine, the exit of the stomach, um, they can be a lot trickier. They, they don't really read the playbook. Um, sometimes they respond well to treatment and other times they're a lot more difficult to treat. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind when you bring your horse in and we're discussing a treatment plan and what to do for your horse going forward. Um, not all ulcers are treated equal because of the anatomy of the equine stomach. So yeah, so squamous ulcers are more common, uh, especially around that line, the Marco Placatus. Um, they're caused when the stomach acid splashes up onto the unprotected squamous portion of the stomach and causes damage, whereas ulcers in the glandular portion of the stomach occur when um, something like, so maybe stress or medication that your horse is being given um, reduces the amount of mucus that is, is produced and then that decreased protection can result in the acid that's produced by the stomach eating away at that portion of the stomach. So just slightly different um, processes by which they occur. And again, those glandular ulcers are much more difficult to treat. Um, so our when is when do horses get gastric ulcers? So again, here is a collection of photos and different scenarios, um, some kind of keywords. So performance horses, uh, we see it during show season when they're traveling and they're stressed and they're working really, really hard. We see it often in our hospitalized patients that are stressed and immunocompromised because they're in clinic for um, any number of conditions. We see um, gastric ulcers commonly in foals, uh, sick foals that maybe had a difficult birth, are immunocompromised because they're young, maybe they didn't get enough colostrum. Um, they can de develop gastric ulcers quite easily. And then I put this little guy in here because this was a case that I saw of a morbidly obese pony. Um, his owners then decided to put him on a very drastic diet. So they restricted his food intake very, very severely, and he ended up with pretty nasty gastric ulcers. So altering your horse's feeding plan or feeding regimen um, can predispose them to ulcers as well. And then this is our big question. Why, why do horses do this to us? Why do they like to get ulcers? Um, this quote by Dr. Dowling, she's a professor at uh, the WCVM, as we saw in those statistics, um, studies have shown us that ulcers aren't uncommon in horses. In fact, the majority of horses have ulcers. So if the majority of the population has something, does that make it normal or abnormal? Um, and this is kind of where I got to thinking about this idea of are ulcers the problem? So a horse may have gastric ulcers and may not say anything to you about it. They may go on and do their job and not show any clinical signs. But if they have gastric ulcers and they also develop symptoms, all of those clinical signs we talked about, then we start talking about equine gastric ulcer syndrome. So it's a syndrome where the horse is suffering from that particular um, problem in their stomach. And that's when we need to start investigating, start doing some diagnostics and seeing what we can do to help your horse. Um, just before we get into the case, I wanted to touch briefly on how we diagnose ulcers. And if you take nothing away from this presentation, please take this away. <coughs> Gastroscopy is the only reliable way, the only means that we have to reliably diagnose ulcers. Because the clinical signs are so vague and so variable, the only way we can tell if your horse has ulcers is to look. So if you bring your horse in for your gastroscopy, we take a camera on a long tube, put it down their nose into their stomach, and we can physically look and see if ulcers are present. Now in order for us to do that, it's really important that the horse is fasted. Because if you bring your horse to us with a belly full of hay, we really can't see all that much. So um, just keep that in mind if you ever are in a position where you want to have your horse investigated for ulcers, it's important to fast them for 12 hours before you bring them in to us. And also important to note that the cost of a gastros or gastroscopy, we bring a specialist in, we have an excellent team involved. The cost of doing a scope is about 25% of what it's going to cost you to treat your horse. So it's really, really great to know that your horse has ulcers for sure before you start treating them um, with fairly expensive medication. 
Okay, so this is our case. Um, this is Roxy. She's a beautiful five-year-old quarter horse mare that was brought into us. Um, she was bought originally to compete as a rainer. She's a very well-bred mare. And she first came to us in July of this year. Um, she's from Golden, BC, and I'm not sure if you remember what it was like in BC this summer, um, but this is what Roxy was living in. So her presenting complaint, the reason that she showed up initially was because her owner had complaints that she was um, coughing pretty severely when she was written. She had a really, really snotty, runny nose, and on physical exam, we found a lot of findings consistent with heaves. So it was great. We could treat the horse for heaves. We sent her home um, for, on that treatment, and we told the owner, like, keep, keep tabs on things. If she's not improving, bring her back, and we'll scope her upper airway to see if we can um, assess how bad the heaves is or whether, we, whether or not we need to be doing more for her. So sure enough, Roxy did come back to the clinic. Um, she came back on August 10th. Um, the nasal discharge had improved and she wasn't coughing as much, but her owner said, you know, like she's still not herself. She's a five-year-old mare. She's usually spunky. She has no energy. She's not eating properly. So that was kind of odd. And then as we started to discuss this more with the owner, it started to come out, you know, she's a nervous mare. She'd been to a trainer recently and been in quite heavy work. Um, and the owner mentioned that, she, you know, she's kind of resentful when I tack her up. She, she didn't used to be, but now she kind of seems sore. Um, so we brought her in with the idea that we we're going to do an upper airway scope. And then our wonderful internal medicine specialist said, like, hey, let's scope her stomach just out of interest. Because um, it wasn't part of our plan. And on her scope, we found quite a few very, very small, but nonetheless present um, ulcers along that line, the margo plicatus. So this is what a normal equine stomach should look like with that nice smooth line. And this was Roxy's stomach. So very irregular margo plicatus. And we also saw what we call hyperkeratosis. So thickening of the squamous um, lining of the stomach, which just shows that it's been irritated and it's been trying to build up more layers to protect itself. So, Roxy has a few small ulcers. And I can remember standing there, and Crystal specifically told me not to say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway, because I remember standing there thinking like, those ulcers are tiny, you can't tell me that that is this horse's problem. But it's so true, and, and Dr. Wa, our internal medicine specialist, kind of explained this to me. Horses are so different from each other, and some of them are super stoic and can stand there with a smile on their face while they're rupturing their stomach. And then other ones can have tiny little ulcers and, and be really bothered by them. And I don't say that as a criticism, it's because all of our horses are so different. So in Roxy's case, these ulcers really were bothering her. And so we had to do something about them. One slide, there we go. Um, so our plan for treating Roxy, we had several things that we had to think about. Um, we had to treat her respiratory signs, so we continued to treat her for heaves, but we also decided that we needed to treat her ulcers as well. And given how smoky it was in Golden, there was a lot of discussion with her owner about whether or not she would stay at the clinic for treatment rather than going back into the smoke, because that's a very stressful environment, not great for her lungs. So she did end up staying at the clinic for a bit. So our go-to when treating gastric ulcers is omeprazole. Um, the equine-approved product is called GastroGuard. Down here, it comes in tubes. And our treatment protocol for ulcers is one tube a day for four weeks, so for 28 days. Um, com uh, it, it's our gold standard, and the way it works is it inhibits the production of gastric acid, so it allows ulcers to heal in a more neutral pH environment. So you can imagine the, ga the gastric acid makes, makes it so difficult for an ulcer to heal itself as it's constantly being re-injured by the acid. Um, as I mentioned previously, it's not exactly an inexpensive treatment, um, and there are compounded products available, um, but the problem with these compounded products is that there's no quality control when it comes to compounded products. Um, and this is illustrated really, really well in this radiograph here. Um, a veterinarian took several compounded omeprazole products and just radiographed them to see what was in the tubes, right? And you can see in all of these different tubes, some contain large pockets of air, some can contain air all the way through the paste. Um, some studies have shown that if you look at different parts of the tube, different parts will have different concentrations of the drug. So it's just not a reliable way. If you're going to spend the money and you want to treat your horses ulcers appropriately, as veterinarians, we really do recommend that you spend the money on the reliable product. 
um, which is GastroGuard. So in addition to our GastroGuard treatment protocol, some of the other changes that we made for Roxy were we suggested to her owner that she decrease her work temporarily, um, that she have pasture turnout all the time or 24-7 access to hay. We also advised that she increase the amount of alfalfa she was being fed, because alfalfa contains a lot of calcium, which is kind of like Tums for horses, right? It neutralizes their stomach acid, which is a real, it can be a very helpful way to augment your omeprazole treatment. And we also recommended that she decrease the amount of grain being fed per feeding. So that helps the stomach um, regulate its pH. When you feed a lot of starchy grains, the fermentation of that grain drops the stomach pH even further, and it makes it tough for um, those ulcers to heal. So you can still feed grain, just feed less per feeding and spread those feedings out. We also discussed keeping Roxy on a half dose of GastroGuard long term to prevent the recurrence of ulcers. Some other adjunct uh, treatments for horses that are predisposed to ulcers, there's UGuard, which is just uh, a powder that you can add to feed, and it's uh, calcium magnesium similar to alfalfa, it just neutralizes the stomach pH. Uh, raw linseed oil is a mucoprotectant, so it just makes a nice uh, coating around the stomach to help protect it. And then low starch grain again to prevent those drops in pH um, from the fermentation of starch. So after her one month on GastroGuard, Roxy's owner had really good things to say. Uh, she had way more energy, she was eating better, um, and seemed far more uh, herself, which is something we hear a lot from clients, like my horse isn't himself, now my horse is himself. So that was really, really nice to hear. Here she is out grazing with her pasture buddies. So she did come back in for a recheck scope, because we like to check and see if our treatment is being effective or not. Um, and on repeat scope, so the first time we scoped her, she hadn't been fasted because we weren't planning on doing a gastroscope, so we never got to look at her whole stomach. So this time around we did, and we did actually find some glandular ulcers um, down at, at uh, the portion of her stomach that connects to her small intestine. So we did elect to keep her on treatment longer because of those glandular ulcers, but the fact that she clinically was so much better, I think really made us feel that we were on the right track treating uh, the disease that was bothering her. So the take home points from all of this, um, I kind of have five, five of them for you. So number one, um, the problem of gastric ulcers really is a syndrome. There's so many different variables involved. And as veterinarians, we really wanna work with you as the owners to figure out exactly what's going on with your horse and get the whole picture. Um, second point is that there's two types of ulcers, squamous and glandular, and they don't respond to treatment the same. So that's very important when we come up with a treatment plan for your horse. Number three is the big one, that gastroscopy is the only reliable way for us to diagnose ulcers in your horse. That's very important. Um, treatment itself with GastroGuard is important, but long-term management in horses that are uh, predisposed to ulcers is even more so, more important potentially. And then number, number five, diagnosing and treating ulcers is really a team event. Um, we get our specialists from the university, we have the veterinarians at the clinic, often we have interns and students involved because um, it's a wonderful learning opportunity for all of us, but we really want to work with you and make you a part of that team so we can do what's best for your horse. And that's all I have for you. So if I have, if there's any questions from anyone, I know Kirby and Crystal said that they would help or I can answer your questions as well. Sorry? Medications that might cause ulcers? Yeah, that's a great question. There are some medications that we know specifically can cause ulcers, and I'm sure the list that we think of isn't necessarily the exhaustive list. So the ones that come to mind for me are um, NSAIDs, anti-inflammatories like bute, correct? Um, are there, there are some antibiotics that can also cause ulcers. Yeah, not as commonly, the bute would be the biggest culprit, but non steroidals like the yeah. Things like that. I've also had a horse develop it after long term treatment for use with dexamethasone, mm -hmm. that's uh, for posteri. Um, so, there definitely are some medications that can cause that as well. And in horses that are prone to ulcers, we often will preemptively treat them for ulcers if they need to be on those medications. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Do the horses, do they have ulcers that don't bother them? That's a really good question. And in the research that I did, looking at these different studies, it would appear that, yes, they can. Um, a lot of these horses that were surveyed, like that survey that showed 93% of racehorses that had ulcers, not all of those horses <coughs> had clinical signs. Um, so whether or not those ulcers might bother them eventually, maybe they're more stoic. It does appear that, like, I'm very interested to scope my own horse. You know, she lives out on pasture, she has a great life. 
Does she have all six? I don't know. She doesn't have any clinical signs, but who knows? So I think there was one question at the back. Suppose a person decides to go ahead with gastric guard without scoping, hypothetically, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so you're however many days into this treatment, at what point do you, like, is it still worthwhile? Will you still see the ulcers if you had a scope done a week in, and will you still be able to see them there and know that you're not wasting your time and money? I just jumped her down, and I was just like, let's just treat it. Right. Not, nothing else. I feel like I'm doing everything right, and nothing. Right, well, and I think Roxy's case is kind of a good example of that. Like, clinically, she was doing so much better, but when we, when we scoped her a month out of daily treatment, she still had scopable, visualizable ulcers, right? So I think that's a perfectly valid point. If you feel that your horse has severe clinical signs and you want to start treating, by all means, but the only way for us to know for sure if you are treating the right thing is to scope the horse. And, but I think we can still certainly do that after you've started treatment, yeah. The one thing it might make it more difficult to assess is the severity. You know, sometimes we get in there and we see they're actually bleeding ulcers, like they're really quite bad, and you know, a week's right. worth of treatment might help just ameliorate that enough where we can't quite assess the same severity, but I think they'd still be visible at that point. Mm -hmm. Is there any work done on uh, bacteriology for gastric ulcers like there is in the There is, um, and it would appear, and feel free to jump in here. Um, the research that I did, it seems that bacterial components are more important, more significant in glandular ulcers than they are in squamous ulcers. So typically with the squamous ulcers, the going theory is that that damage is really due to that gastric acid splashing up and damaging unprotected gastric lining. But the glandular ulcers can get quite complex and there is thought that there may be a bacterial component. So sometimes we do go to antibiotics and treating gastric ulcers in, in severe cases. Yeah, Jeannie and my dad would have to yeah. 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 Um, We don't stuff. have a clear cause and effect like we do in humans. So we know in humans, if we put Helicobacter pylori into human stomachs, we can induce ulcers. So we don't have a clear cause and effect in horses. So we do it on a very case-by-case -case basis, and that's why gastroscopy can so help. Um, because if your horse isn't responding, but it's been treated with, say, the 28 days of GastroGuard, we can investigate further, is it in the pylorus? Is there a delayed gastric emptying component? And we can deal with those different clinical signs with different medications other than GastroGuard. And then in the cases of bacterial infection, those are typically cases where we've been treating for one or two months even, and we're not seeing the level of um, response that we would expect. And some of us will do some testing to test for it, or some of us will just go ahead with an antibiotic trial, and sometimes it'll address it. We'll go right to the back, and then we'll come back to you. What is the most rarest case of ulcers that you treat? The rarest case, like the weirdest? Yeah. I don't know, the weirdest one I think is that pony, that super chubby pony that I saw, just because his <laughs> ulcers were so bad, and it was just from him having a severely restricted uh, amount of feed, but I think that's really telling. It, it shows us um, the impact that feed changes and, and those kind of management changes can have on, on, a, on a horse or a pony. <coughs> and I think there's one in the middle. I guess I should have been more clear, like UGARD, that supplement that I had there as an adjunct therapy, it is marketed, I believe, as a, a preventative. It's not a treatment, per se, um, because it, it, like I said, it's, it's like Tums for horses. It just helps to um, neutralize their stomach acid. Um, but I think you're right, there are a lot of products out there that have, that have these incredibly lofty claims. And it seems to me, in, in the reading that I did, simple is better, like feed your horse good hay, make sure they have lot, like feed always in front of them like they were meant to have, um, feed smaller portions of grain, um, things like that seem to go, are documented to have more of an effect than all of these fancy um, supplements, some of which I'm sure do do some good, but in terms of the documented effect, 
Um, I think it seems in the case of ulcers, simple is maybe more reliable. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Yeah, I've heard some horses that did really well on that, and some owners would swear by it, and others not so much. I didn't really read any studies that said a whole lot yeah, about so aloe. All the studies on aloe have been done on mice, so we know for sure that it works <laughs> on mice. And we have some data in humans that we think that it works as well, but in horses, nobody has ever determined what concentration and what dosage you would need. So it's like yogurt. We know that yogurt seems to work in people as a probiotic, but we've basically determined you'd have to do a continuous rate infusion for your entire life on the horse in order to get the volume of yogurt you need for them. So I think it's the same with aloe. I use it sometimes because I think maybe it'll help soothe, but there's no real data that proves that it works. And, and taking out people would be like one of those things you would do is because it takes out sugar. Doing what with beet pulp? Sorry. Take out the beet pulp for the with for the horse with ulcers. The beet pulp isn't necessarily bad. It's it's fairly low starch, correct? Yeah. So beet pulp is very low starch, and so it provides you with an alternative source of energy, okay. which may or may not help with ulcers. The thing that I need would caution you about with beet pulp for horses with ulcers is that sometimes horses with ulcers have decreased gastric emptying, which means that they not only have the ulcers, but it affects the function of the stomach as well in moving all the food past it. So when you, as you guys may know, because you're always told to soak your beet pulp, it tends to really glom together. It gets really, really awful and really difficult to get back out. So it can cause actually stomach impactions in horses. So when horses have delayed stomach emptying, we could potentially cause <coughs> have a higher risk of stomach impaction as a result of it. So that's the only reason why I may steer away from it. But nutritionally, it does make sense. I think I'm going to pass it over to Ben here because I know we're running late. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming out. And <laughs>